Hi, this is Allie. This is Sienna. Hey guys, this is William Weeks, and you're listening to Talking Armageddon. Talking with- Armageddon with BQ. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to the Impact Lounge Talking Armageddon segment where we sit down with some of your favorite Impact Wrestling stars. Adam handled the last couple interviews with KM and Eli Drake. Now I'm back in the saddle with the new monster of Impact Wrestling, Congo Kong. Kong, thank you for being here, first of all, and uh, it took us a little while to get this interview scheduled. Yeah, yeah, a little schedule conflicts, and it's all your fault. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, we just happen to be messing each other. It's all good. I'm glad we're able to finally get it under control, get it under wraps, and get this thing going. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, talking to you right now, it's good to know that you actually speak the English language. Otherwise, this would probably be a really awkward interview. Well, I mean, here's the thing. You're talking to Steve Wilson right now. He's the man behind Congo Kong. You're not actually talking to Congo Kong, because if I was in face paint right now, then, yeah, you wouldn't get a word out of me. I'm always telling Falabon Facebook that I'm waiting for the day we get that 20-minute Falabon Congo Kong promo battle. I think that'd be good television, don't you? (laughs) No, 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 no. (laughs) No, no, no is right. Uh, Speaking of good television, so, you know, I'm not in the business like you, but with my channel, my podcast, there are times that I need to step away and detach myself from wrestling. So are you a TV guy, movie guy, sports guy? Like, what is it that you do when you need to step away and just detach yourself for a little bit? Um, I like movies. I like comedies, uh, really anything that makes me laugh and, and, uh, uh, like you said, it takes me away from, from wrestling for a little bit. Um, anything funny, uh, I'm a big Marvel movie fan. I uh, don't know Jack about the comic books because I was never a comic book person. Um, but like since they started making movies, I've been hooked. Yeah, I don't know Jack either. Um, have you seen Black Panther yet? Oh, yeah, of course. That was there. <laughs> I haven't seen it yet. You've not seen it yet? No. <laughs> You got to be like one of like 12% of uh, Americans that haven't seen it, man. I like, think so. It's really good. Yeah, I seriously need to get around to it. Do you, do you fit inside the movie theater seats? <laughs> yeah, I'm not that big. Come on, man. I'm not trying to body shame. <laughs> that sounded funnier in my head. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm, I'm. A baby giant, not quite a full-grown giant yet. How uh, tall are you exactly? Legit 6'6". Oh, Jesus. When I pick my hair out, it's like 6'8", 6'9". Yeah, you're one of the few stars I haven't met in person yet. So like we said offline, I'm going to make sure I get over to Indiana one time and uh, check you out one of these days. But something I want to get into with you, we've had a lot of Impact stars on the channel and haven't had an opportunity to talk about this yet. You guys have recently partnered with independent promotions and you're doing the Twitches and the one night onlys. How is it feeling doing that and getting such a unique opportunity to get in front of a different crowd and and being able to get the impact product on the road in front of new eyes? Well, it's, uh, it's actually been pretty fun. I've only, only done the, uh, the, uh, border city slash destiny loop, um, which I've worked for both of those companies before, but it was great to see, you know, all the fans come out and support us. Um, you know, great to see Windsor, such a, such a huge wrestling community, you know, just show up and, and, and pack that, uh, that arena. And we actually had to turn people away that night. So, you know, looking forward to, to going back there at some point. Um, and then also the destiny fans, you know, uh, at the Don Koloff Arena, uh, which is actually owned by Santino Morella or Anthony. Car- I don't remember. Corelli? Anthony? I can't think of his last name, but yeah, um, we were there for the Destiny show on on a couple Sundays ago, and uh, um, just a great experience, a great you know chance to get out and see that there's more than than just the people in Orlando who love us, you know, and and for all the negative that we've encountered over the last, at least I've encountered with, with 
with impact over the last year or so, you know, it's great to see that, you know, there's people that, that are actually grasping, grasping hold of our product. You know, I've never asked an impact star this, um, and it's in regard to the negativity. How do you handle, you know, as being a part of impact, the negativity, you know, the negative tweets, the posts from people who frankly probably don't even watch the product. You know, (laughs) um, usually I'm able to ignore it um, and just kind of look over it or, you know, if it's, if it's something too bad and I just don't want to, don't want to deal with that person, I'll just go ahead and, you know, delete them or block them or whatever it is. And like, ironically, last night I, uh, I posted on my personal Facebook page, uh, and your new, uh, monster of impact wrestling is Congo Kong with the picture, uh, that I had gotten off Twitter and, um, you know, everybody's congratulating me. And then down somewhere in the middle, there's a fan who says something, about the guy he he says this guy isn't even Samoan he's just some fat white guy with boobs on your personal Facebook page yeah and I'm just like okay first of all I'm not white right (laughs) (laughs) second of all I've never claimed to be Samoan a day in my life um never pushed a Samoan agenda you don't see any Samoan tattoos on me or anything like that um and then Beyond that, I mean, people, yeah, they talk about my weight, they talk about my shape, whatever. They can't do what I do, and they're not on TV. They're not watch. I'm not watching them on TV. They're watching me on TV, so not a big deal. But like for whatever reason, like I just, I guess the fact that it was on my personal page that this dude was trying to trying to throw shade at me, I just had to rip into him. And then I guess it turns out that the the guy was uh, uh, legit mentally uh, handicapped, I guess. And uh, so I stopped, but other people didn't, and I didn't make them any the wiser because even even the mentally handicapped need to know, you know, where to where to stop and where to leave things alone. You know, I've, I've worked with with special needs people for years, and you know, they had to have some sort of structure, some sort of rule, you know, just like everybody else. So sometimes you just have to fire back and let them know, you know. You don't have to say stuff like that, and there's no reason for you to 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 try to go out and make me look bad, you know. And especially when you're not doing any better than I am, you know. There's there's a lot of fans that 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 are armchair quarterbacks, as we call them. Yeah, exactly. The armchair bookers like to tell us what what they should or we should have did, and what they thought was better, and whatever. But if if you you know if you're so good at it, then why don't you apply? You know what I'm saying? For that position to to be able to book these shows and, and write these shows or anything, like sub- submit some ideas, you know? Why do you think wrestling fans in general are so negative? So I'm a big basketball fan, so I'm a part of a lot of groups. And there's, you know, some trolling going on and some, you know, trash talk here and there. But it's never this that outright negativity. Why is that with wrestling fans? Yeah, I don't know. I, I think you, uh, you just can't please everybody. And I think uh, over the last... 20 or so years, WWE has kind of uh, shaped people's image of what a pro wrestler should be. Um, you know, speaking from, you know, me being six foot six, you know, 300, 330 pounds and maybe not looking like I've been to a gym a day in my life, whatever. Um, you know, just because I'm not the body guy that, you know, you would see, I'm not a Braun Strowman case in point. Uh, that you can see in WWE um, that I'm not worthy of of being on a ring or being in a ring on a, a pro wrestling show. And um, I just think that, you know, that's ridiculous because if you look back, you know, to the 80s and early 90s, the reason Hogan got as big as he did was because he had Andre and because he had uh, the one man gang and, and Vader and and, you know, those big guys. Bam Bam Bigelow, Tugboat, Typhoon, uh, Earthquake, you name him. He had all these big guys that helped him get to where he was. He made money because they made money. They made money because he made money. Then all of a sudden, you know, some of those big guys start dying. And then all of a sudden it was like, whoa, uh, we need to cut down on, you know, some of these guys that we use or whatever. And let's, let's focus on these in-shape guys. Well, the in-shape guys started dying too because they were doing everything, you know, 
that they were big and bad enough to do, you know, steroids and drugs and, and whatnot, and they were dying off as well. So, um, you know, WWE really never, I guess, recovered from that. And so I think people kind of took to that, you know, and um, I call it the cookie cutter image, you know, because if there was a time where everybody looked the same and they did the same thing. And, um, you know, and so that's what, you know, people were fed. And so that's what they're used to. Whereas, you know, you get impact and for a while, um, I would say that they were kind of mimicking WWE. And if you had success in WWE, you were sure enough to go to impact and, and, uh, be used and probably, you know, be on top at impact. Uh, whereas now with this new management, it looks like they're trying to make some new stars and that is what they need to do. That's what they need to go back to just to be different. Don't, don't take the, uh, the recycled WWE guys and, and, you know, just try to try to make their own stars. And I think, uh, people aren't used to that. And so they're kind of, kind of, uh, you know, crapping on the product a little bit because of that. Do you think there's still a place for big guys in wrestling? I mean, obviously there's a place, but if this were the 80s, you know, a man your size would be taken completely different than right now. It's like a different, just a different scene now. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's definitely a place for the big man, but what people, uh, what they miss out on is, are the athletic big man because now you know, we're a different breed. We're not just the big lumbering guys. We're, we actually can move, we, you know, we can do planches and we can do moonsaults and, you know, jump off the top rope and all sorts of stuff. And there's, there's a, a vast array of big guys on the indie scene, you know, that, that need to be seen, I believe. And I believe that, uh, pro wrestling could, uh, could benefit, you know, TV wise, television wise from that. I want to get back to the border city thing for a second. So I just finished watching the Twitch last chancery and the uh, other one, uh, one night only show you're being booked totally different on these shows because you're being booked in the main event. So what, and as the BCW champion, so how has that been for you to be, uh, you know, featured in a role much different than how we see you on impact? Um, well, I think uh, I think things are going to start changing for impact as well for me. Um, and I mean, the the Border City and, and Destiny shows, uh, they were kind of what I'm used to. Like, you know, you, you, you see the that that particular version of Kong on impact where there is the short matches and, you know, I go out and mop mop the floor with somebody and then I'm done all of a sudden or whatever. Um, but like on these, on the, the independent shows that I do, most times I'm in the main event and, um, you know, maybe in a, a big angle or I, I hold that company's title. And so my matches are usually 15 to 20 minutes long. Um, so it's not, you know, a huge deal for me per se, but, you know, just kind of, I guess, letting impact get to the point to where they can present me as as possibly a main event player, you know, and kind of put me in that picture. Um, so it, yeah, it was, it was awesome those couple days, you know, but being that, you know, that was kind of my territory, I guess. Um, it really made sense. You mentioned other titles. What other titles are you holding currently? I think I saw on social media, you had won one the other day. So, uh, what are you holding currently? Man, <laughs> You gonna do that to me? Oh my bad. Let me, uh, <laughs> let me see if I can uh, go through these without missing anybody. Um, I am the current Heroes and Legends Wrestling Champion. I am the current XICW Wrestling Champion. I am the current Border City Wrestling Champion. I am the current Border Town Pro Wrestling Champion. Um, which is actually up by Buffalo, New York in Ontario. So I kind of, I kind of run Ontario right now, which is pretty sweet. Cause I'm not Canadian. Um, I am the champion in Keystone wrestling out in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Keystone championship wrestling. That's what it is. And then also Apple, 
no, what is it? APWA is it's American Pro Wrestling Association. That's what it is. I am their quadruple crown champion, something like that. It's a yeah, it's it's, it's quite a bit. I think I got everybody. I think I got XICW. I think I got. Yeah, I think that's everybody. Hopefully that's everybody. Also a tag champ at uh, Midwest Pro Wrestling Association. Good Lord, you are a busy man. I am. Oh, and Juggalo Championship Wrestling Champion as well. (laughs) Oh, man. You know, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to list off a couple championships. I had no idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, For a while there, I was running with like four or five at once. And then all of a sudden, it just like popped up to too many. Um, but I mean, Hey, that, that just, it, it, I guess it speaks to, uh, my character and and my ability as a wrestler that that many companies, you know, put their trust in me to, to carry their banner. And I, I, for that, I'm honored. So as long as I can, and as long as they need me to, I'll be that guy. You know, it always feels good to be recognized and to receive that validation for, um, you know, whoever's calling the shots. I want to transition back into Impact here real quick. You just wrapped up an angle not too long ago, which was arguably the biggest angle of your Impact wrestling career, and that was with Abyss and the Monsters Ball match. Um, it's it's funny because you've actually become the poster boy for being in, you know involved in angles that don't get the payoff, you know, that have had to end prematurely. And I'm referring to obviously Tyrus departing the company. And then when Maria Canellis departed the company, that kind of threw a wrench in the angle with Lauren and Braxton and Allie. So how does it feel to actually be a part of an angle now that, you know, you were able to see it through and get that payoff? Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's pretty accurate. Um, but yeah. And then this one, this is definitely my biggest to date. Um, it was it was fun. It was it was awesome to watch how it unfolded, you know. And I I uh, I had to tape it all within I guess four days um, because during the tapings, um, well, prior to the tapings, my grandmother had passed, and so her funeral was on the second day of the tapings, and so I didn't get there until the third day, which there were six total days. Um, but you know, having to squeeze all that in. You know, there weren't too many matches or anything. It was a lot of in-ring and a lot of uh, backstage promo stuff. And it was a nice change because it wasn't, you know, explosion match here and impact match here and, you know, a bunch of killing myself uh, every day, all day, you know, and and not really, I guess, I don't want to say not getting anywhere with it, but everything meant something this time. And so uh, it was nice, you know, seeing that, that they were, uh, willing to invest a little time in me, you know, and, and try to try to make something, uh, try to build something. And, and it was awesome that, you know, it was finally working out. <laughs> All right. So let's talk a monster's ball real quick. And I know you've mentioned previously that you've tagged up with abyss on the Indies and so on and so forth. And now you've got the monster's ball match impact is invested in it. They're promoting it pretty hard with the graphics. And I think the fans are also invested in it because they feel like or they felt like it's the last time we could possibly see a best wrestle on TV or maybe the last time we're going to see a monsters ball match you're victorious in this match do you think this is the match that's going to propel you to that next level man I absolutely hope so um, it's been a, a long long rough road uh, you know here I am 19 years in and I finally get this huge match and uh, yeah, hope is is nowhere but up from here. And you know, I doubt that this is the last time that we see Abyss on TV. Maybe for a while, but not for not forever. I don't think. I think he still has you know a little bit of go in him. So um, who knows? You might see Kong and Abyss tag on TV. Yeah, there we go. But now that you're the new monster, you could possibly adopt this monster's ball match to be your very own. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever done a match like this before in the Indies? I mean, I would imagine you've probably done a no DQ or a street fight or something like that. Yeah, I've done similar stuff, you know, with tables and bladders and tacks and all that crap. Yeah, that that was the first time for the barbed wire, I think, for me. But um, I didn't end up, you know, going through any. So that's you took a body slam off the top rope at one point, and 
I don't know how to say this. That looked really painful. Yeah, yeah. It uh, it uh, jarred me a little bit, you know. I got to sound tough, so. <laughs> yeah, we know you're tough. We know you're tough. Um, I really felt like adding Father James Mitchell and Jimmy Jacobs is what really put the whole thing over the top. I mean, two guys who could talk so well. Man, yeah. Like, the, the interview segment that we did in the ring, um, or the promo, I guess, uh, last week that aired last week with uh, the the well three of us and then a best join, but that was intense. Like that made it for me. You know what I mean? Like hearing those two uh, talk back and forth, like it. That's what made it real for me. It made it made it stand out. Like wow, this is this is some good stuff right here. You know, I got to ask you when the new management came in. Was there any concern that maybe you weren't going to be retained because it seemed like there was a huge changeover and a lot of the wrestlers who showed up when you did were either released or left on their own merit. Um, okay. Which, which change? Cause we, since I've been there, we had a couple. Like when Scott and Don came in. The current group. Oh no, I wasn't, wasn't really worried about that. Cause, uh, I mean, you always have the, the idea in the back of your mind that something could happen or they could, you know, feel a certain way about you because let's see, what was it bound for glory? Uh, because of that, that, that storyline that I was leading into going into that, you know, there was a, well, there was a departure and that kind of messed me up for my bound for, for, excuse me, bound for glory match. So I was kind of stuck out on that one. And, um, I really didn't have a direction, I guess. And it left me on TV for approximately, approximately three months, uh, leading up to that. And, um, I was kind of wondering, but, you know, when I got to Ottawa, they, you know, they kind of told me, hey, this is a uh, consider this your rebate re debut and, uh, you know, how you handle it is up to you, you know, and and uh, we're going to try to do it and do it right this time. So I was I was pretty, uh, pretty uh, comforted, I guess, you know, they comforted me in that 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 regard um, that I would have a spot that I'd, I'd, I'd be OK. Um, you know, I knew they liked me. I knew Scott liked me. Obviously, I'm his champion uh, at Border City, but um, just you know, just that 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 little bit of uh, uneasiness, you know, showing up to tapings and not really knowing what's going on. And then once I found out I was put with Jimmy Jacobs, that was like my uh, my uh, confirmation that you know things would definitely get better because you know it's. It's uh, he's in in creative, and then now he's also my manager, so he's he's gonna want to fight for you know us having stuff to do. I want to give you an opportunity to put Jimmy Jacobs over for a second. I saw a picture of you guys not too long ago. It seemed like it may have maybe been early twenty. So it seems like you guys have damn near come up together in this industry, and he seems like such a creative mind. And I think you know, like we said earlier, he was part of what took that angle with Abyss to the next level. So. What is Jimmy Jacobs like in real life? Um, a lot of what you see on TV is Jimmy Jacobs in real life, to be honest with you. Um, there's not much, not much difference at all. And like him, him versus his, his, uh, his on-screen character. Yeah. Not much difference. Uh, they dress the same. They, uh, talk cryptically from time to time like that. Um, you know, he's always been an eccentric guy, you know, even, and I've known him. <laughs> excuse me, since he was 15 or 16 years old, uh, we did, you know, train together um, in Holland, Michigan, and uh, uh, have known each other, you know, for all that time or whatever. And, um, you know, Jimmy, yeah, he's just, he's an awesome guy. And I, I love, like, listening to his insight, you know, on, on uh, how he thinks a wrestling match should go or how he thinks an angle should go or how, you know, somebody's character uh, development will help them in the long run. And, um, you know, just listening to him give the young guys advice, like, it's so funny because he'll tell you something and it'll be like, I don't give a crap uh, what you think or whether you, whether you listen to it or not, you know what I'm saying? That's just what I, that's just my opinion. You don't have to listen to it. You can do whatever you want. I don't care, but that's just what I told you. And so like, it's 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 so funny because he'll take the time and he'll give him the advice and then he'll tell him I don't care if you listen to it or not, it's whatever. But 
No, Jimmy, he's a great guy. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad, I'm glad that, you know, wrestling came full circle for us. And, you know, we were, we were tag team partners in the beginning and now, you know, we're on impact wrestling together and, and like, it's just kind of organic. And I, uh, I equated to what, uh, Greg, the hammer Valentine said one time when he was, uh, he was working at a backyard federation and he got a promo and he says, you know, I've sold out Madison square garden and now I'm selling out the backyard. Everything in wrestling comes full circle. That's a good quote. It did come full circle for you guys. Did you feel like there was a chance he was going to come to impact wrestling? Is it something, did you guys have any kind of dialogue when he was released from WWE? Did you think it was a possibility? Um, he contacted me and asked me if I was still working for Impact, and I told him, yeah, and that was the last I heard from him. Um, I figured he'd probably go back to ROH or something like that. Um, but, yeah, then I happened to be watching the Bound for Glory pay-per-view, and he popped up, and I was like, whoa. <laughs> and got to thinking, like, wow, that would be crazy if they put us together. And, and then, lo and behold, they did. You know, it kind of sucked because when he came out at Bound for Glory – it translated to TV that the people didn't know who he was or it was really quiet. But in all actuality, they were actually setting up the six sides of steel during his segment. So a majority of the fans couldn't even see him. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. A lot of times they, they have to, to do stuff like that to take away from what's actually going on in the ring. So you'll get like a backstage package or something, you know, and, it, it makes sense now, like, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there. I was just watching at home. And so, uh, yeah, that, that would make sense. Uh, people at home kind of got that, that information, but nobody else did. Yeah. The crowd had no idea what was going on from what I was told. Do you feel like the Congo Kong character is best suited to have a manager? So watching the global force wrestling stuff, you had a manager. I don't remember his name, um, offhand. I apologize. Great character though, by the way. But he was your manager, and I really felt like watching those, he made you feel like a main eventer, as opposed to you just coming out by yourself, a character who doesn't talk. So do you think you're best suited to have um, that entity attached to you? Absolutely. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not a promo guy, and I've never claimed to be a promo guy. And not only that, but I think it takes away from my character if my character talks. So I try to avoid it at all costs. And, uh, you know, typically anywhere I, I've gone and had a manager, I've succeeded, you know, and if I was ever without a mouthpiece, you know, I've, I've had some success, but it's harder to get uh, people as emotionally invested or, or against me um, without it because the mouthpiece, you know, he speaks for me. He, he, tells, he tells a story that my body language and, and my wrestling can't tell. And so uh, I think uh, having him, you know, in my corner is definitely a benefit uh, as far as TV goes. You know, maybe one day it'll it'll we'll break up or whatever. Who knows? And and uh, go our separate ways, and I'll be by myself, which you know I've I've been able to handle and I can handle. But I think it for for now, you know, definitely it, it's definitely helped. You know, definitely. Uh, taking me to a different level you know it's jimmy jacobs he's you know one of the most creative minds like he came up with the list right he sure did and that was something that was very over with the uh, wrestling community how important do you think it is to communicate with your body language as someone who can't talk i can think of wrestlers you know kane's probably a pretty good example big intimidating guy but once he started talking for me it kind of lost the mystique bobby lashley is another one that comes to mind like the first time we actually heard Bobby Lashley speak, I laughed so hard because I was like, what is that that just came out of this giant dude? Like, <laughs> he was so scary. And then all of a sudden he he talked and like, wow, that's not good. But uh, to me, like, it says everything. If I don't, if I don't have to speak, you know, it, it, what is it better to be assumed smart than proven stupid? You know what I mean? And so with, without me having to speak, people think that there's there's some sort of mystique there. You know, they okay, does he understand English? Can he understand English? Can he speak English? You know, there's all kinds of questions there that are that are asked but never answered. And I kind of like having that mystery to me. It's kind of like when uh, people ask me, 
you know, where where I hail from. And I say the deepest, darkest jungle. And then they go out and they'll say the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa. And I'll get on them and I'll be like, I didn't say anything about Afri- Africa because now you're pinholing me. Now you're, 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 you're putting a specific place in me. It could be the deepest, darkest jungle of your mind that Congo Kong is from. Does that make more sense? I think it does, you know? Uh, the, the type of character that I'm portraying, I'm, I'm more of a nightmarish figure than I am, you know, a, a, a trying to portray a, a legit, I guess, jungle savage, you know? And, and uh, um, I don't know, I'm probably off subject by now, but uh, I just, uh, yeah, I, I, I think me not talking is... Uh, it's kind of vital to my character because I don't I don't think that me talking would do it any justice. And if I did talk, I'd have to try to mimic the ultimate warrior what I did, because I why would I come out and sound like I was I was uh, a normal talker? You know, what I'm saying I wouldn't speak normal like everybody else would. Well, otherwise, why am I? Uh, wearing the face paint, and why am I wearing the, the 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 gear that I'm wearing, the garb that I'm wearing? So, yeah. Yeah, you've got this monster character, and there was a move in Monsters Ball where, I don't know what you did, but he kicked out, and there was a look of disappointment on your face. So you're this monster character, but there was still, um, the, you know, that was one of the first times I think that I saw that human element in you. That's what I'm. What I mean by my facial exp- expressions, my body language, like the the camera guy, uh, the head director, he tells me every time he's like, your your facial expressions are money, and they make for great TV, and I appreciate that. And that's that's what I have. So when he, he he kicks out of my move, and I'm like I'm looking around like what what like I have to show some sort of like emotion in that moment because he just kicked out of a big move that he probably the normal guy shouldn't have kicked out of right. And so how do I get that over? I can't get up and go like bash the referee in the corner or whatever, or, or tell him he's not doing his job or or. You know what I mean? I can't, can't, it's hard to put heat on anybody else in that moment when I don't speak. So I have to show some sort of emotion. It's a kid I remember watching Kamala, the Ugandan giant. And I like this character, but they pretty much portrayed him as someone who was fighting, but he was too dumb to know what he was doing. Absolutely. And that's, yeah, that's something that I've really struggled and, and, or not, str- I didn't struggle, but, you know, try to, I had to struggle to keep people away from trying to book me like that uh when i first got to impact the management um well some of the management was trying to get me to portray a kamala a kamala like uh character some of the instruction i got was uh um go out to the ring and i want you to look up at the lights like what are these things and then i want you to look at the people like why are these people looking at me and just kind of do that and like make these funny, funny noises and faces, you know, as you go to the ring. And I'm like, mm, no, those are the same people that were there yesterday. And these lights are the same ones that have been there since I've been coming here. I'm not going to do that. That's not my character. I don't know, you know, who you hired or whatever, or who you thought you hired, but you hired Congo Kong and you keep me as Congo Kong. So I need to portray Congo Kong. Uh, if you wanted somebody different, if you wanted me to do somebody different, then that's what you should have did. You should have hired me as somebody different under a different name. But this is my character and this is what I'm doing. I kind of had to stick to my guns on it. And, uh, you know, I think the new management understood that and knows exactly, you know, who I am as a character versus, you know, the old management. They were going back to the the, the Kamala days, you know, and they they felt, you know, they felt like because I was a big man that I had to instantly be covered up. You know, they were trying to come up with ways <clears throat> for me to, to, to wear more clothing and still, you know, keep my character. So at first they wanted me in a shirt and pants. And then I'm, I'm like, okay, so you want me to look like abyss when I go out? Like next thing you're going to tell me, put on a mask. And so then they finally, there are some people in the creative who were fighting for me, thank God, and like Abyss. And, uh, you know, they finally got rid of the shirt idea. Then they had the idea to have me wear Abdullah pants. And so they got these karate pants or scrubs or whatever they were. And they got them in the worst colors possible of red and blue. Um, and so they had me try them all. And I'm like, yeah, this this is not going to work. This is not going to be good at all. 
And so meanwhile, I'm, I'm like standing there and I'm looking like the Kool-Aid man. And I'm just like, what do I do? What do I do? And Marche Rocket, who was there at the time, we were jokingly talking about running around with a with a sad face, sad look on my face to try to get some sympathy to get out of wearing, having to wear this crap. And so uh, luckily I walk out of the door of the, uh, the, the makeup room slash uh, seamstress room. And um, Karen Jarrett is right there and she's talking to Moose. And so I just kind of walk up and kind of join in on a conversation. And I do this little dance where I'm wiggling my hips back and forth so that you know, it draws attention to these ridiculous red pants that I'm wearing. And she looks down and she starts laughing. And I was like, yeah, this is what they want me to wear on TV. And she says, oh, no, baby. No, absolutely not. You are not wearing that. And I was like, this is what they want me to wear. And then she, she's like, have you talked to Jeff? I was like, no, I haven't talked to him yet. I haven't seen him. Do you know where he is? She said, yeah, there he is down the hall. And so she looks at Jeff Jarrett and she says, yeah, he can't wear this on TV. This is not going to work. And so Jeff was like, yeah, no, it's not going to work. And uh, so th thank God for that moment, you know, and, and I actually got out of wearing the Abdullah pants um, because it could have been disastrous. It could have been something that, you know, I may not have recovered from. So, um, you know, I'm glad that that uh, things happen the way they happen. But, yeah. You know, I talked to Karen a couple of weeks ago at an indie show. I got to meet her. Real sweet lady. I liked her a lot. Oh yeah, she's awesome. She, she, I call her Mama Karen. You know, what I'm saying she, she was uh, always looking out for me, always extremely nice to me, extremely cordial to me. You know, whenever she saw me, it was hey, and she'd run up and hug me and give me a kiss on the cheek, and you know, it was just, it was really, really, really good people. Her and Jeff, I'll give you know that to Jeff as well. He's, uh, you know, I think she's made him a better man, but he, uh, he's definitely you know, good dude to, to work for and be around. Yeah. I waited till Jeff walked away and then I told her, oh my God, you are so beautiful in real life. But I want to transition into bound for glory. Is it true that you actually had a match scheduled, a tag team match scheduled against Tyrus and it was going to kind of be like the celebrity style match of the show, uh, kind of like Moose when he teamed up with D'Angelo Williams? As far as I know, yeah, it was supposed to be him and his Fox News anchor co-host um versus me and a, a partner and yeah um because you know there was i guess issue with the management at that time he had he had uh given his notice and and left do you know who your partner was going to be i have absolutely no clue i think they were just going to pick somebody and put them out there it might have been cam since that was you know who i was teaming with when i first got there so who knows were you disappointed with how the whole angle with Laurel ended up, um, you know, playing out? Because you ended up on the pre-show with Slammiversary in a tag team match. And uh, you mentioned KM. He was on the show not too long ago. We interviewed with my partner, Adam. And uh, he said they kind of inserted him into the Mike Bennett spot, I think. So, I mean, are you kind of disappointed that, you know, it was a high profile angle and then it kind of, you know, just ended up as a pre-show match? Um, well, that particular storyline was my end, so I wasn't disappointed with that. Um, I was disappointed with the, the Tyrus feud, yeah, because I was looking forward to working with Tyrus. You know, I was looking forward to having that big marquee match, or at least what I thought would be a marquee match. You know, two big guys going in there and going at it. And I was hoping to, to uh, be able to do some stuff that uh, they would say that two big guys shouldn't be doing. You know what I mean? Kind of like, I guess... You know, the Monsters Ball last night, um, you know, showing some athleticism and and uh, being different, you know, and not just being those two big lumbering guys. Do you think now that Tyrus is back, there's any way that they will revisit that? I feel like it's uh, it's inevitable that, you know, he and I uh, don't cross paths again you know, or that we cross paths again. You know, just it just makes sense. Like how could you not book it? You know, you got these two giant guys that, you know, people are salivating to see together, you know? So that angle on TV, um, I think it came off, it was confusing as a fan, as a, as a, uh, as a viewer. So it almost seemed like Tyrus came out like maybe you were bullying Laurel. 
she was more so turning on me at that point, and uh, she was bullying me. And I think she had slapped me, and that's when I kind of had enough and snapped, and I had her up like I was going to power slam her, and then that's when his music hit. She ended up pulling me off the off of, or uh, yeah, pulling me away from him or whatever, you know. And that was before they just kind of dropped the angle. I, I wish they'd have went, you know, just a little further to actually pay her and I off. But you know, say love you. Sorry for jumping around here a little bit. I meant to ask you this uh, earlier when we were talking about the Jarrett's. What is your relationship like with him right now? I, I know previously you had said you know you really believed in Jeff. He was going to be the guy to help you buy your mom a house. So you you feel pretty highly about Jeff. Um. Well, we we haven't talked since he left the company, but I mean, before that, we were fine. We we've been fine, and I still have nothing nothing against him. I'm actually really glad that he's going into the Hall of Fame, and you know that he's he's uh, kind of <clears throat> excuse me, gotten a, a second chance or another second chance or however you want to look at it. You know, um, I still believe in you know him being a. Uh, uh, a great mind in the business and after all he did start the company that I'm currently working for um, so yeah like I, I wish him absolutely nothing but the best and I'm sure when I when I do get to see him again that you know it'll be all smiles and, and hugs and stuff so yeah I'm I'm, a, I'm a, still a, a, a fan of Jeff Jerry. Now, with the way that Global Force Wrestling shook out, you know, it uh, first kicks off with the tapings and everything, and then eventually morphs into Impact Wrestling. With the way it all shook out, do you feel like, I don't mean to be controversial here, but do you think the GFW concept is pretty much dead in the water at this point? Or do you think he can... I think it's 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 probably dead at this point. Um, you know, with with things the way that the way that they happened, I guess. You know, with the, the the impact management and then him and you know and and like almost having impact become global force wrestling, you know, fully or whatever. Um, I just think it's it's kind of a it'd be rough, you know, it'd be kind of hard to to uh, go back to at this point. I'm gonna ask you. I asked uh, Adam Thorne so this. I'm gonna ask you the same thing. Do you think that Jeff gets an unfair shake from the wrestling world with Global Force Wrestling? Um, you know, it's basically seen as a joke at this point, and people try to start companies all the time. You know, Era Lucha's getting ready to kick off, and uh, he was just a guy trying to follow a dream. Right. Yeah. I mean, yeah. He he had uh, he started Impact or TNA as it was back in the day. And then, you know, when he was done with that, you know, he came up with the idea to start another wrestling company. What's wrong with that? I think uh, people like you, like we were talking about earlier, people are way too critical of what goes on in wrestling and all they're, all we're trying to do is offer the fans more, more options, more things to watch other than, you know, just the main shows that are on TV. Now I find it rather fascinating because I think, people assume otherwise, but you actually got to impact on your own. It had nothing to do with Jeff Jarrett taking over. Yeah. Um, actually, uh, it was based off of a couple of uh, loops that I did on the Indies with Abyss. You know, there was one night that I'd, we teamed together and then the next night we, we worked against each other. And ever since he, he felt like I should be seen on TV. He's like, you deserve a shot, man. And, um, you know, for a couple months, I was just like, oh, well, I appreciate that, you know, and never really thought anything about it. Um, because, you know, in wrestling, you learn real quick that you don't believe anything until you see it. Um, and he uh, came up with the idea to uh, possibly bring me into Impact. And then he got, he fought for me a, a tryout match. And so, uh, when he called me and, and let me know, you know, the details for the tryout match, which were that January or last January, I should say, um, that happened to be the same time that Jeff Jarrett was coming in. But Jeff Jarrett was just uh, a booking consultant at that point and not, you know, the uh, executive producer that he had become by the next set of tapings. So, yeah, I mean, I got in, I, I came in and I did my tryout match and, um, I was supposed to do a second match, but they were blocking for the wedding. And so when I went to go thank John Gaburik, 
uh, for the opportunity, he told me, he said, uh, he said, we like what we saw. We saw enough. We don't need your second match. Uh, we want to bring you back in March with a full story. Gotcha. Well, that's a great story to hear. Um, transitioning into personal a little bit, you, uh, you're actually in business for yourself right now, right? As well, uh, making ring gear, I believe. Yeah, that's, uh, that's what I do. <laughs> Those in wrestling are, are my, uh, my two, um, sources of income and so i guess they're my my jobs my career right now um and i've been been working on gear kind of self-taught since 19 or not 19 i'm sorry 2007. <laughs> yes i've been doing it for a while now and i've made gear uh uh that you've seen on tv you know both on wwe and uh impact wrestling um i've made gear that's been seen in new japan so yeah, so my, my gear has been seen, you know, all over the world. Um, and, and, you know, as far as TV shows and whatnot, uh, yeah, just something that I kind of picked up because I didn't want to pay the ridiculous prices that people were charging to get gear. And then the person that I had working on my gear, she would never do it right. And so uh, it originally started as something for me to make stuff for myself and then turned into me making stuff for other people. Are you allowed to say who we've seen on TV with your gear? Uh, most recently, P.D. Williams, but Moose has had my gear on TV. Um, uh, oh, Dave Chris from OVE wears my gear on TV. Um, Will Ospreay I've made kick pads for. Uh, I'm trying to think. It's a, There's been a, a long list of people like... So how does the process go with the wrestler? Is there like preliminary sketches or they just contact you and say, this is what I'm thinking? Well, sometimes they give me, they give me just kind of uh, where, where they want me to go with it. And then I'll go and try to create, but I find it easiest when they give me some sort of sketch. Cause then I can see kind of what they were thinking in their mind and I can go from there. All right. So I want to talk India with you. I've been in the military a long time. I've been at Iraq a couple of times, Kuwait, Qatar, Kyrgyzstan, Saudi Arabia, Africa. I've done my fair share of traveling outside of the country. And one thing that always remained constant when we were outside of the base in the city or mingling with the people for whatever reason, they were always in awe of us, especially those of us who were who are minorities, um, you know, at least by American standards, we are. But they don't see Asians, African-Americans, Hispanics and anywhere but on TV. So, and especially with the kids, they were like all up in our grill. So how did the people in India react to you? Because you're not an average size guy. We actually filmed a segment uh, of me walking through the streets of Indiana, or Indiana, <laughs> Indiana. <laughs> the streets of India in full gimmick. Um, and it was crazy because at first people were scared and like they were, they were scattering everywhere we walked, people were scattering. But by the time we were done, they were running like around me and behind me. And like, it was almost this magical thing where they, they, they were scared at first, but now I was in the traction and I was, they were in awe of me. And it was just the craziest thing ever. Like, it just, I don't know. It made me feel so special, so important. Like just for that moment, for people to respond to me the way they did, like, to be in fear, you know, even to the point where um, there's a guy that that rode by on a scooter and I growled at him and like he swerved as I growled and then like there was a car coming and like I I growled at him and like he hit the brakes like really hard and like made the tire screech and it was it was nuts like you know just the way people were in awe of me and then. You know, for for that to turn into wow, we we must have a celebrity here. Let's let's follow him around for this this next few minutes or whatever. And then by the time I got in the car, they're all cheering. It was it was just nuts. It was awesome. I really hope that footage surfaces one day. That would be great. I meant to ask you. I'm gonna bounce around here. Do you do your own gear? Yes, yes. That came from that conversation where I was talking to Jeff Jared and. Um, I was wearing just trunks at the time. I thought my trunks were cool. I thought I, I liked my look the way it was. Uh, but you know, with 
the other person, you know, in creative trying to cover me up and Jeff Jarrett just thinking that I needed a different look. The way he explained it to me was I see wild crazy man up top with your face paint and your hair and it's awesome. But then I see pro wrestler when I look at the rest of your body and in my mind, I'm going, okay, that's kind of what I was going for, but you know, okay, what do you suggest I do? And he's just like, something different something with things hanging i guess and and uh um you know just something different so immediately my mind went to uh like a loincloth type deal and uh you know it kind of i guess evolved from there it started off with a short one and then it went to a different one which was longer and um you know, had different tatters and tears or whatever in it. And then this last one that I, I wear currently um, kind of has the uh, tassels on it. And I, it was just a matter of trial and error and, and trying to figure out what fit and what looked good on me and, and uh, how to, uh, I don't know, how to take that, that suggestion and make it work. Yeah, I can see where that would be very frustrating and probably extra frustrating because you're over here like I can actually do this myself right yeah exactly you know tell me what you see in your mind because I don't want I don't want to ignore you and just wear what I want to wear because then and, you know obviously it's not going to turn out good for for uh, my booking um, but at the same time I don't want to uh, go out there and look ridiculous which you know is how I felt they were, they were trying to, to make me look. All right. So I want to wrap things up here with a handful of fan questions. Uh, I got a lot of them, but I think I touched on most of it so far. So, uh, just going to get into a couple of them. Jerry Pariso asks, what is the story behind the big splash as a finisher? And what is your favorite title that you've won? Um, I'll start with the second. My favorite boat would be the border city wrestling boat because, um, Every time I've wrestled for Border City, well, the bigger shows, it's been about roughly anywhere from like 600 to uh, 1,500 fans, you know. So those are some of the biggest independent shows that I've, I've been a part of. And so to win that belt was really kind of special to me. Uh, and especially because it was my first international championship. Um, no, I take it back. It wasn't my first international championship. But... Uh, it was it's still the biggest, you know, to me, the biggest. Um, and then what was the first part of that question again? He was asking the story behind the uh, big splash as a finish. Oh, well, growing up and, and being a big fan of Vader and, um, you know, the athletic big guys, uh, I'd been afraid to hit the moonsault for, for forever um, on a person while they were lying down. But I still wanted to do so. Excuse me, something cool. I didn't want to be um, just your typical big lumbering big guy who relied on big boot and choke slam for finish. And so I, I wanted something I could do to everybody, you know, because I knew I wasn't going to be able to pick everybody up. Um, and I wanted it to be something that made me stick out. And so uh, I just kind of started flying off the top rope. And, and you take care of your body, too, because obviously you wear knee pads and there's wrestlers who do similar finishes that don't wear anything. Yeah, I, I make sure that I have no padding in my knee pads. I, I actually just replaced the padding in my knee pads um, because it was it was starting to wear out a little bit. And, uh, you know, even even now, like I, I do the splash pretty sparingly. If I don't have to do it, then I won't. You know, but if a, a promoter's like, well, I really like to splash, then I'll go ahead and throw it in. But um, for me, you know, it's it just it's more it builds more mystique, I guess, you know, to save it and, you know, use it for special occasions or whatever. But, um, yeah, it just it just kind of came out of uh, a place of me needed something different. You know, I didn't want to do everything that every other big man did. I'm still trying to figure out how you can do a moonsault. The first time I saw you do that, I'm like, how in the hell? <laughs> Very carefully. Uh, it actually started with, 
uh, doing backflips off of a diving board. And my trainer saw it, and he's like, uh, we need to practice that in the ring. And so uh, I did that. And for, I'd say, the first 16 or 17 years, I was actually afraid to hit anybody lying down. And then one night I decided that uh, – um, I think I wrestled Sammy Callahan that night at AAW um, in the Chicago area. And after the match, I was beating up uh, random people that came into the ring. And, and one of them, I just, in the middle of it, I told him, I, I think I gave him a choke slam. And I told him, just lay there. And uh, like I started climbing up the ropes backwards. And at that point I was committed and so I couldn't just I couldn't just jump down or whatever I had to go for it and so I went ahead and went for it and I didn't kill him and so I was like wow okay so now I know how to how to hit the moonsault without killing anybody all right so dead punk gauge asks and I think we kind of touched on this a little bit but uh you know get into it again has how much of an influence has Jimmy Jacobs had over your career at impact um your in ring and everything and this is kind of a two-parter. Again, we'll get into the first part first. But he was saying, he was asking where you got your style from. He says it's like a mixture of Haku, Kamala, and the missing link. But let's do um, the first part. Has he had much of an influence on, uh, you know, everything you're doing? Um, Not really. He, he kind of lets me go with the flow, you know what I mean? And, and uh, I think he knows or he feels like I know what I'm doing, you know. So he doesn't, he doesn't really try to steer me in any direction i guess um just kind of tells me what the deal is and you know i'll ask him his opinion if i if i need it and uh um then we go from there but for the most part he's not he's not he doesn't feel like he's there to kind of police me or or turn me into what he thinks i should be he liked what it was from the beginning and that was kind of why uh he suggested, you know, that, that he'd be the guy to, to manage me. All right. So the second part of the question, and I know you get asked this a lot, but who influenced the Congo Kong character? As far as uh, the gimmick or like my wrestling style, which one? I think both kind of. Um, yeah, it started off as a, a, a cross between Umaga and Kamala, um, but... I didn't want to be the dumb savage that I was, or that that I'm sorry that that Kamala was. Um, I wanted to. Be, I like I like the way Umaga was more savvy, you know, and and you know you weren't gonna get one over on him. Um, I uh, I uh, just I don't know. I I uh, started working for Juggalo Championship Wrestling, and they wanted me to paint my face, and they kind of gave me the name Congo Kong. Um, and so uh, that came from there and just kind of, I guess it's it's evolved over the years because I look back to some of my early work for them and I was kind of playing that more Kamala-ish character at that point. And like, um, you know, it's just kind of evolved over the years to what it what it, it turned into. But I see myself more as a, a Vader, um, maybe even some Undertaker in there, Um you know, some uh, maybe a little bit of Mick Foley, you know, not necessarily with the moves, but with the uh, the way I approach the match, the psychology or, you know, approach wrestling, I guess, um, kind of where Mick would use his body uh, as opposed to, to trying to power everybody. You know, he would use his body a lot of times to, to, to run his offense. So that's kind of what, what I think I do is, you know, more more of using myself as a weapon. Bob Davis Jr. is asking if there's any, he asked if we'll ever hear you speak on camera, but um, I think we kind of touched on that. Is there any footage out there of you in character speaking on camera? You might find a, a clip or two of me saying one or two words um, on YouTube somewhere, but you'd have to look for them. I don't know where they are, but yeah, it's, uh, it's pretty rare. All right, so last one here, uh, King Nerd is asking... How far do you think the Congo Kong character can go? So, you know, we talked a little bit about the indie scene, you winning a bunch of championships, but you haven't been in that world title scene in Impact. If you were to win the world title, do you think it's something that the people would accept? And I ask that because in this day and age of wrestling, where, you know, it's a new era, 
Um, you know, the big guys like that aren't carrying the gold. In my opinion, they'd be crazy not to. <laughs> like, why wouldn't you uh, have that situation where, you know, you got a guy that nobody expects to win the title, win the title. You know what I mean? It just, to me, it makes more, it makes sense. Why not give the fans something different for a change? Um, it'd be one thing if uh, I wasn't proven to be a guy that could carry you know, a boat or carry a championship or a company or however you want to look at it. But, you know, I've, I've, I've proven that, you know, and then, you know, the management now, they know that, you know, whether or not they decide that I'll, I'll ever be a big enough star for them to do that. That's up to them. But I believe uh, in my, in my heart of hearts that, you know, they'd be a fool not to, because I am something different. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm a big monster hill that, you know, people can't, help but to kind of like <laughs> there's some people that actually boo me but most people they kind of they end up liking me after a while you know and why that is i don't know but uh for whatever reason you know it's something that that people are grasping hold of and you know if you don't take advantage of that then kind of makes you look like the fool i guess like not saying that you know they look like a fool or whatever uh but yeah, you know, I'm just saying the the match last night had the most views on YouTube. Uh, so last thing I want to ask you, and I, I, a lot of fans like hearing about this kind of stuff. What is the atmosphere like at Impact right now with the wrestlers, um, with this new management? You know, basically, there was a time you know Dixie Carter used to come on and say I got this big announcement you know this and this and then it would come out and it was just the same old stuff um un unnewsworthy unbuzzworthy stuff and then these guys come in and it almost seems like they have something interesting or new or exciting to announce every week and you know as of this morning they started tweeting out matches for the big time wrestling card and that looks really promising so what is the atmosphere and the attitude like right now? Um, it's, it's great. You know, just as good as it's ever been really, uh, since I've been there, like I've not had a, a moment where, you know, we were, we were all feeling like everything was, was, uh, you know, about to crumble or, or whatever. I just, I, I believe, uh, you know, John and, and Scott have a completely different vision for this company now. And uh, this vision includes, you know, using wrestlers from around the world, which is awesome because that means a lot of my friends get to get seen on on TV and pay-per-view and whatever. Um, and uh, yeah, they're just, you know, they're trying to trying to take what they have and, and make the best of it and, and uh, help it recover from from any ailments that it had before, you know, so we can get back to that excuse me, to that point of prominence where, you know, we were the clear cut, I guess, number two, you know, <laughs> it's kind of hard to, 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 uh, touch the machine these days, but you know, it, it's, uh, it's possible to separate your, yourself from the rest of the pack that you're running with. So that's, uh, that's what they're definitely trying to do and get us to a point of prominence again. And I think we're going to get there. The, uh, television product has been much improved and really exciting. I want to thank you for coming on the show. I know that it was a, a little difficult to get it scheduled, but I really do appreciate you spending this uh, last hour talking with me. Yeah, man. Thanks for having me. Uh, it's it's easy when I can come on, a, on one of these interviews and have a conversation with somebody as opposed to them just asking me a bunch of questions that I've asked. I've been asked and I've answered, you know, several million times before, you know. I just, I kind of want to be like, go listen to such and such podcast and, you know, <laughs> don't ask me that again, but you know, you, you, you brought it from a different angle and I appreciate that. And I appreciate you saying that that's exactly what I try to go for when I'm conducting these interviews. So that means a lot to me and thank you to everybody for listening. Hope you enjoy the interview with Congo Kong and, uh, we'll be talking to another impact star very very soon so if you enjoy the interview definitely tweet out congo kong let him know you liked it and i'll talk to you soon peace hey fans this is steve wilson the man behind the monster congo kong and you're listening to talking armageddon with bq